Good morning and welcome to the Mindful Messenger Show brought to you by the Liberty Beacon Media Project. My name is Amanda Johnson and today I am talking to Valerie Abrahamian, I never know if I'm saying that right, about advocating for special needs children. Valerie is the founder of Advocates for Angels. She's a non-attorney advocate, author, special education law teacher, and speaker who helps parents of special needs children in the development of their children's individual education program, or IEP. She wants to help them enable each child to reach the highest expression of themselves and fulfill their purpose for being on the planet. As a mother of two special needs children, Valerie has been called to work with families, not only in education, but also in awakening to the gifts these special angels can bring into their lives. Welcome, Valerie. Thank you, Amanda. I'm so glad <gasps> to be here. I so love that we get to talk together today about this topic. Um, I don't even know if I told you, but last year I was able to study with uh, Dr. Nikki Elliott, who is an inner light uh, method, uh, energy balancing. She was the, she's the founder of it. And so she loves to work with special needs children. So I've been in this conversation for a while now. Um, with you and with Nikki and with a few of our um, friends. And so I'm just excited because I love the perspective that you all bring to this yeah. experience with special needs children. And I also love that you guys are so equipped to empower parents to stop feeling like they're completely out of control. And so um, I'm excited about this today. Thanks. So am I. So am I. Good. So, so let's kind of start at the beginning. You mentioned in the bio that um, you had two special needs children. So, you know, we're talking about you, you wrote this beautiful, beautiful book and um, it was about two of your daughters. Yeah. And I'd love for you to share a little bit about like, what was it that made you realize you had to write the book and tell this story? What was that story? Mm -hmm. So, uh, I started thinking about having to write a book probably when Chanel was very young and when I realized that our system, our educational system was very broken, that they weren't serving the children with fidelity and that I needed to start driving my daughter's educational program and started researching and teaching myself and getting all the material and information I could possibly get a hold of to learn how to be a better advocate for my daughter. And um, I started thinking, this, this has to get out there. I don't, no one's talking about this. This is so wrong. How can this be happening? And, you know, I was frustrated and angry and shocked that it was even a reality. And so I have been thinking of it for many years. And so then, um, uh, you know, as I went through my journey, and I'm sure we'll be talking about that in a while, but as I went through it, um, I was getting closer. To, I was writing, you know, started writing things down, and I had tons of paper and chapters and information, but I didn't know how to put it together, and I just kept writing. And I kept asking God, asking the universe, how can I do this? How can I put this together? I really want to write a book. And then um, you were at, you did one of your programs at the Yoga Den, which is where I studied yoga. And I was like, hmm. And then um, my teacher, Lisa, you know, was talking about you. And of course, you know, I always read everything, knew everything that was going on at the, at the Yoga Den. And I was like, oh, who is she? I have to look into her. But I wasn't quite ready yet. I wasn't quite ready yet. I think that was around 2012 or 13, somewhere around there. And then, so then I kind of put it on the back burner and then I was at Glen Ivy and, and involved there for a while. And then I met another good, good friend there uh, and she invited me to go to the women's conference. And I go to the women's conference with her and that was in 2014. And who am I sitting next to? Amanda Johnson. And so then I'm like, okay, this is it. I'm ready now. And then in 2016, my book was written. Yeah. So such, such a good journey. I love, I, I think it's really important for people to hear who are thinking about it, that there is a law of readiness. You know, there is like 
sometimes there's an incubation period where you get started. It's like that caterpillar craze, you know, and there's just so much energy and then something happens, life happens, or you just, it doesn't feel like it's coming together. Right. And, or there's another chapter of the book that's supposed to be in the book that hasn't happened yet. Right. <laughs> Cause that happened to me. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, so tell us about the story that is driving this book. Like what, what really compelled you, what was happening with your daughters? Cause both of them were struggling. So tell us about them and what some of their particular challenges were in the system. Mm -hmm. So Chanel was diagnosed with autism at, um, three years old and, uh, that she had a, um, a, uh, very serious seizure, uh, when she was uh, 22 months old and she was typical developing before then. And then she had this just huge seizure. Um, and since after that seizure, she developed autism. So she was talking and verbalizing just like any little two-year-old would do saying mama, dad, dad, bye, bye, see birdie, you know, putting two little phrases together. And when she woke up from that seizure, she never spoke again. She was nonverbal. And she was pretty much nonverbal until she was around eight years old. And that was after a lot of speech and language um, uh, integration and um, services and uh, work, just working very strongly in interacting with her, getting her all the ABA she needed and everything we possibly could get to get her to verbalize. Um, she did do uh, echolalia, which is a form of verbalization where the kids just copy other things they've heard or they copy the TV, they, co they memorize um, phrases and words and they even say it in the same voice tone as they hear on the TV. So, and they actually communicate that way. And Chanel used to communicate that way. She would have conversations where she would pull out of her little bank of information of all these video phrases in her head and say something that was relevant to that conversation with a phrase from a video. I mean, it was like magnificent, like who could do that? Wow. <laughs> That's how, she did not have her own words. It was all memorized scripting. So, uh, and that, that is pretty typical for the autism spectrum mm -hmm. kids. And uh, so uh, she was, um, we were going through that journey of giving Chanel her uh, the services she needed. And um, I was learning my advocacy in, going, in uh, assisting Chanel. And then my older daughter, Jessica, um, she had um, bipolar disorder. And uh, so she was dealing with that in her life. And um, she then later on, uh, when she was uh, older and when Chanel was, was a lot older, it was fast forward years, like about 10 years. And then uh, my daughter ended up, Jessica ended up passing away in her sleep. And it was um, uh, and not specific on the reason, the purpose for her passing, uh, the autopsy showed that she, it could have been a seizure or it could have been some heart uh, disorder that she might have had because they did uncover some heart problems in the autopsy, but they could not be um, specific with which one that was. So that happened and that was really what broke me open to my huge transformation in my life and really seeing the big picture of my, my journey. Yeah. So let's talk about that because um, that's something that um, you and Nikki have in common too because it was right after the passing of her baby that all of her gifts kind of blew up and she started to see things differently. So yeah. I would love to hear like, what was that? I mean, that amount of grief, I can't even imagine. Plus you've got another child who needs you to be in the game every day yeah. because of her needs. Like, how did you navigate that part? Um, well, I just did the best I could, which is what all anyone can do. So, um, but I'll tell you one thing, <laughs> that phrase of when people will say, God never gives you more than you can handle. I just would want to punch them in the face when they would say that to me, because it's like, this is more than I can handle. And I didn't want it. So it's not a lesson and I don't want that lesson. So, you know, it's just, that's a trite 
thing to say, even though I know people just don't know what to say. And that's what comes to mind. But really, when you're in that much grief and pain, it just doesn't help. <laughs> so, um, and, and, I, and I was going through a lot of doubting. I was doubting God. I was being challenged in my faith. Um, at the same time, a lot of stuff was going down. The exact same timing, um, I was um, working so hard at developing a disabilities ministry at the church I was attending. And it was thriving. It was going so great. And the difference between my disability and the others, uh, and this was a, a, a while ago. This was like in 2005, around then. Most of the churches that had disabilities ministries uh, had segregated um, places for the kids to go. So it was the same, kind of the same as the school district, where, oh, you have a child with a disability? Well, you go over to that special class over there. They don't get to go to regular kindergarten and be with regular kids. They have to go to the special class. And I was always an inclusion advocate. And I said, that's ridiculous. They need to be, we're one body, we're one church. We, we're not, we don't divide. We, we shouldn't be divisive. We're supposed to be one unit. And so I was training aides to go in and have the children go into the regular Sunday school class with an aide. And I um, uh, generated those aides through the uh, high school uh, program, the youth group. And they loved it. So I would have trainings and train them on this is how why they act. This is why autistic kids act this way and that way and gave them the education they needed. And they were, they were volunteering and they were loving it. And it was just going so great. Well, um, that all fell apart because I didn't, wasn't receiving the uh, support I needed from the um, pastoral staff there. Um, I generated a lot of income through doing conferences and events and that I had in my fund, my disabilities fund. They weren't allowing me to utilize those funds to grow my ministry. They were just really limiting me on my vision for it, even though it was very successful. And, and it was also bringing in other families from our community because they were like, oh, they have an amazing disabilities ministry. I like that. So new families were coming, but yet they didn't see how positive and wonderful that was. And I was really kind of ahead of my time because nobody else was doing that then. And they were, and so the, the a lot of the congregation, which is typical, were like, "No, we don't want that. We're scared of that. You know, we 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 don't want those autistic kids with our kids. They they're going to hit them or bite them." Or and it's just that fear that a lot of people have, just because of not understanding, um, didn't have the information and um, just really ignorant to the kids. And um, so with all that being said, um, I was struggling with my Christianity or, or organized religion, really. I wasn't struggling with my belief of knowing God. It was really organized religion um, that I was struggling with. And uh, so um, with my daughter's then death, that really, just even blew that even more out of the water with struggling with, wait a minute, something's wrong here with what I have believed my whole life. And, and I was also one of those, which many women are, think that if they do this little, this certain list of things that to make you the perfect, good Christian wife, Christian mother, Christian woman, that then you're going to be okay. And, you know, you're going to have clout in the Christian community. And, you know, so I worked my tail off <laughs> to be on every board possible. and was working my tail off on this disabilities ministry. And I thought, wait a minute, I should have gotten an A in, in everything. And then you're going to take my daughter? So that just made me doubt even more of, of what the whole, my whole basis of my belief system and how I was raised, right? being raised in the church. And, and that was my entire foundation for my life. So I, I, that set me off on a huge journey of um, seeking the truth uh, for myself. And, um, and that's when I started expanding um, my belief of God and looking at things differently and, and took God out of the box and said, he's not um, the God that just sits there and says, you, you sinned today four times and 
you know, you need to make up for that and that we have to earn our way for her to, to, to gain his love and all that thinking that I had that was not correct and that I heard from pastors, you know, that this is what I would hurt her and take in just because of my childhood and how I thought and how I heard things and perceived things. That's how I was interpreting it. So I had to change all that thinking. And, um, and then, so that was also a big, huge journey. And, uh, and then getting through that and really getting to know myself because that's one of the other huge lessons that a child with autism brings you is that they, or any specialist child, not just a child with autism, any specialist child will, um, if a parent can get to that point of seeing, wow, they have changed my life. This is such a huge gift. I would never be the person I am today if I didn't have this child in my life. If God didn't bless me with this child in my life, because they really do, are a huge blessing. They change your perception and give you so much love, compassion, um, um, teach you how not to judge, um, not to judge a book by its cover. All of those different things just open you up to just a different level. Um, that's what the kids do that, and that's the big picture of them. And which is also why I believe that's why they're coming in to the world today at such a, a um, exponential level, because to help us. Because look at where we are today. Look at where we are. The diversity, the judgment the hate that's going around today, even though on the other end we say, oh, we don't, we don't discriminate. Everyone's equal. You know, every, we're, all, we're all the same. But no, you know, that's really not what's happening. Yeah. <laughs> so they, they, they are here to teach us. They're our teachers. And uh, both personally in a family and in the big picture as a global consciousness. Um, that, that's yeah. what I believe. What was, what was the moment for you? Cause I, you know, my son didn't have any special needs or anything, but I do remember these very significant moments. I had to write my own book about them because yeah. they were like these moments where I realized, Oh, he's here to help me learn how to live again. <laughs> like, yeah. like, what am I doing thinking that I'm going to help him figure life out? He's already got it figured out. Um, and so, like, what, what were one or two of those moments with your kids where you had that knowing that they were, they were there for you as much as you were being there for them, especially mm -hmm. on those special needs journeys? Yes. Um, just Chanel's whole way of being, she is, she could never judge someone. She doesn't know how to judge. She doesn't know how to think of someone in a less than way. Um, so it just amazes and amazes everyone. Everyone always says that about how pure she is and not innocent because she really does, is very aware, knows what's going on, understands the whole thing, but her just non-judgment and love and compassion for everything in the world, for nature, for she's such an animal lover and for all people and her um, just how intent and present she is every second. Um, one of her gifts is, and every person she ever meets, she'll remember your name and then she'll ask you certain questions when she meets you. What do you, are you married? How many kids do you have? Do you have pets? What's your anniversary? What's your birthday? And she will remember all of those things the next time she meets you. Now, who does that? I can't remember this one's name when I first meet I'm so bad. And she remembers all these facts about you. And it's like, then she starts, you know, I don't know what they do, but they like have these memories that are amazing. And um, so, and, and then she on Facebook will send you a Facebook message every anniversary, every birthday, and she has it all there. And people are always amazed. How does Chanel remember everybody? I don't know, but she does. And she, she has little logs and things and lists and she'll put it in and then, and alarms, oh, today's so-and-so's anniversary. <laughs> she said that's my story. So that's one of the examples. Wow. Yeah, yeah such, such careful attention they, yes. they seem to pay to everything, right? They're like, so such observer yeah. mode all the time. Yes, they take everything in at uh, such a more higher level than we do or that we can even understand. Mm -hmm. which is why a lot of them have the sensory issues they do 
and why they act sometimes in a different way than we do because they're being overloaded sometimes they can't handle how much energy and perception and information they take in and which is you know why people that why are they acting that way well that's the reason why yeah yeah if you could see all that and hear all that or feel all that at the same yeah. time yeah. you'd probably be curled up in bed too <laughs> Exactly. exactly. Yeah. One of the things that I learned last year is that um, in, with the studies showing that um, children with autism spend a lot more time, like when they've done um, readings on their brain, the children with autism are in the theta state more often. They have more theta wave energy. Yeah. And that's the energy where we get to in deep meditation, where we're most capable of healing our bodies and healing our stories. And so like, they basically live there. I mean, that's amazing. What can we learn from that? You know? I know. I'm Phenomenal. Happy <laughs> yeah. Phenomenal. And then born that way. Yeah. That's the way they yeah. are. Yeah. And I remember, um, I remember you sharing the story about, um, was it a doctor or a teacher that told you that Chanel would never read or write or like, what, seriously, what was the diagnosis for her at that point? Yes. So when she was first diagnosed, it was the UCLA uh, pediatric team that were, were diagnosed Chanel. So mm -hmm. they had a whole staff that would look at not just one doctor, but many different uh, doctors, pediatric uh, developmental doctors, that would um, observe and do the assessment, and then they would come up with the, with the diagnosis. And their diagnosis of Chanel was, at three years old, that she would not uh, admit, she would never talk, she would never be, never be verbal, she would never be able to read or write, that she would not be successful in school, and that she would most likely have to be institutionalized. Mm. And that was the diagnosis they gave for Chanel. Yeah, so this is like early on in the, in the autism experience in our culture, yeah. right? Like 1994. Right, so they didn't know what they were talking about, <laughs> clearly. <laughs> Not at all. So, so the end of the story is, you know, Chanel graduates high school with yeah. honors, right? Yes, a degree with honors. Yes. And now she's doing what? She is a dog groomer. She got her dog grooming credential. So she went to the, the regular, typical credential training program that everyone goes to. She did amazing. In fact, her teacher told me, Valerie, you don't understand. Chanel is better than anyone I've ever trained when I, when I visually show her and, and demonstrate to her this is how you cut. This is how you do the nail, you know, whatever it is. <clears throat> I'll show her one time. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then she does it, and she does it perfect, just like I did. But if you would, with this, this is, and this is how Chanel learns. So she's a visual learner. But if you were give her, given her a book or, or given her a lecture and then said, now you do it, she would not be able to do it because that's the autism, that's how it impacts her. And it impacts every child in a different way, but that's how it impacts her. So it's just finding their specific strength and, um, and working and building off the strengths and then knowing their weaknesses and then just not going there and keeping on the strength. Yeah. And that's the key for every child. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, special needs are not. <laughs> yeah, yes. I mean, I always say that to moms. I always say, every child has their strengths and weaknesses. It's just, you know, it's, this is just so, it's a non-brainer, you know? It's like, just, this just makes sense, you know? And, and that's why with Kit Ma, a lot of parents, they don't, they come to me and they say, we haven't told our, our child that they have this or that or whatever the label is. We don't want them to know. And I always say, okay, I understand because you don't want them to feel different but they already know they're different. And, and, and I, it's not that you don't have to tell them, you're diagnosed with this, a label, because I don't like labels either. But 
to just explain to them, these are your strengths and these are your weaknesses. And we're going to build off your strengths and these, the weaknesses areas we need to work on. And that's why we have goals and that's why we have Valerie and that's what we're going to work on. And for them to be self-aware, to teach them at a young age, to be self-aware of that, that's a huge gift. Instead of pretending, oh no, nothing's wrong. You know, so I try to work on their perception of that. Yeah. Yeah, so so I'm sure that every parent of a special needs child, and honestly, even um, gifted children, have certain challenges, right? Like on the on the spectrum of challenges to ease, like there are always these challenges that happen for each kid. So, what like walk us through like how did you do this? How did you what did you do for her that got her from a prognosis like that to being a thriving young adult right now doing something she loves and doing it as well as she does it. Like what are some of the things that our audience can put into practice? Mm -hmm. Um, So the first thing I did was I, I, like I said, I studied special education law. So that's IDEA is the federal law Um, here in California. It's the California education code. And I studied that and studied that and studied that and read it for hours and hours every day for many years. And then I and experiencing going through the IEPs, learning the different programs, learning all the information that you need to know. I mean, it, it is absolutely a journey. No parent comes in knowing this is how I already know how to advocate for my child and I know what that my child needs. No, we don't know. So that's my, the first steps that you, is in it for every child is you get assessment. You get assessment in every area of the suspected disability of that child. And then you, the experts do the work for you. Then the experts come in, they tell you, here's the strengths, here's the weaknesses, these are the goals, this is what we need to work on. And then you start building and developing the IEP. So I just was very um, diligent at, at opening every door and, and, um, and ruling out. And I do this with all my kids now. I rule out. <clears throat> so I, I assess in every area that is available. And then I rule out, okay, they're fine there. So we can rule that out. Oh, they're not fine here. So we need services in that area. We need goals in that area. So that's always the foundation for, to, for any IEP for any child. So I, I fought and made sure that Chanel had everything that was available to her through our school district and whatever other means we could. Sometimes you have to go through insurance and and other um, means um, if you need to, but FAPE is free and appropriate public education. So educationally, the district is responsible to fund the needs of the child in education when it relates to education. So um, I just was very, very persistent in in that. Now, um, as you can imagine, it's been 20 years since uh, I first started out with Chanel and uh, the, our school districts are much different now. So back then, because like we, we touched on, um, that was the beginning of people just, the system and society just understanding what is this new autism like? Because it was, it was a new, really a new form of autism that was being diagnosed. Um, you know, I'm sure there, there were kids around, but they were never diagnosed with it. But because before it was the autistic kids were the kids that were severely um, intellectually delayed and they could, they were just in their own little world and those, they were institutionalized. That was typically what the autistics looked like before. Today, it's this whole new you know, spectrum where they, and, and many, many, the majority of them are, are uh, typical developing until 18 to 28 months. And then within that um, gap of time, so, uh, a viral intrusion or something will trigger the autism in the child and then the child becomes autistic. And today, um, one in 59 kids are being diagnosed, which is is a very high number. It's much, much lower than that because the CDC doesn't come out with the data collection results until four years later. So in in 2016, it was one in 68, but those data was from 2012. And now in 2018, it's one in 59, but the data was taken in 2014. So do the math. We're... It's just, you know, 
it is it's a huge huge problem today yeah worldwide not just in the united states wow yeah so so i'm hearing get all of the assessments done develop a strong iep plan yeah and then like what about engagement like in the the actual like embodied advocacy because you know I, I used to be a teacher and i remember looking at those ieps and i wasn't a special education teacher but man those things are fierce they're so intimidating to a teacher yeah. Yeah. So what are the supports for teachers or what is, what are the responsibilities for parents to be involved in their child's education in order to make sure they're getting what they need because like you said the system isn't great about delivering what it's supposed to on its own. Yes, absolutely true. Um, so um, for the teachers, for the general education teachers and even the special education teachers, it's a team, okay? So that it, for, uh, for a school district to take a child and put a child in a special ed or a, even a general ed class and just say, okay, teacher, it's all your responsibility, you do it, that, that's not right. That, that's completely wrong, that's not the right way to do it. That there's a team that's on uh, for every child and, and how you determine that team is through those assessments. So if the child needs speech and language, you have a speech and language pathologist on your team. They need occupational therapy, you need to have an occupational therapist on the team. And it goes on and on. A psychologist, you know, a behavioralist, whatever that child needs. So all of these specialists become a part of the team. They support the teacher in making sure those child's needs are met. Because a, a teacher is not an OT, speech pathologist, a behavioralist, all these other things. Now, what I disagree with very much so, and one of the ways that the districts try to decrease funding is that they say, okay, we're going to have the uh, behavioralists come in and train, consult with the teacher, and then teacher, you're going to magically become a behavioralist, and you're going to be able to provide those <laughs> work on those goals and you're going to be able to meet those goals <laughs> which is insane. for all 20 children in your classroom yes mm -hmm. yeah so uh i don't let that happen because but they will try they will try to uh, to provide oh yes you have you have aba or or a behavior intervention but it's consultation it's like mm -hmm. no that's not services that's you come in and talking to the teacher once for a half hour uh, twice a month, and then you expect my teacher to provide ABA services. I don't think so. <laughs> so some of those are the, the just the little um, kind of strat strategies that the district uses to look on paper like see uh, California State Board of Education. We're staying within the mandated uh, requirements of the law, but really they're not. Yes. So if that's where the parents need to have um, educate themselves know what's available and what their child needs. And if they don't, they need to get help through an advocate or sometimes even an attorney uh, to make sure their child's needs are being met. Because I always find it so funny when I talk to parents and, and when, when parents say to me, oh, my district was great. I got everything for my child that my child needed. I always go, they don't know. They, 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 don't, even, they don't even know what their child needs because those are the ones that think they got everything, but really didn't get probably very much at all to meet the needs of their child. So it's, it's, if you, you don't know what you don't know. Right. So, and it's a huge universe of information. And so you have to be careful, you know, and, and just make sure that uh, your child is, is getting their needs met. And, and that's where it gets, it gets difficult. Um, and I always say that there's a, a point in every parent's journey when the light bulb all of a sudden goes on in their head and they realize, oh my gosh, I have been wrong. They're not giving my child what my child needs. They, they're, they've actually lied to me that are, or they're, they're, they're steering me wrong. They're not telling me what I need to know. Why aren't they telling me? Why didn't they tell me my child could have speech and language services, Valerie? Why didn't they tell me that? 
because they're not going to tell you. They're not going to educate you. They're not going to give you. Here's all the services that your child needs, and we're just going to hand them to you. That's not how the system works at all. And um, so there's always a point. And then when that parent reaches that point, the light bulb goes on, then they always are remorseful to, why didn't I do this sooner? But you can never change that. Because when the light bulb goes off for every parent, it's, a, it's when it does. And that's the way it is. Yeah. yeah. So let's talk about that. Because that, you know, I was wanting to circle back to the, the more personal journey. Right. Uh-huh. There's like, there's like the, the practical, here's what you got to do for your kid. Right. Yeah. But then like, what happens? You know, your kid goes to sleep. Right. And what is going on inside your mind and your heart and dealing, having to deal with a system that isn't advocating for you and teachers who may not be equipped and other kids who are mistreating your child, like give us some, some insight or some tools to be able to navigate that stuff. I, you have such powerful stories in your book about, you know, these moments where adults really failed your daughter. Like yes. time, yes. and um, and you know when I, I mean, just dealing with a few of the characters in my story with my son, like ugh, I can't even imagine. And my son was more than capable of handling himself in that moment. He did, but to have a child who is not capable, like I can't imagine. So yes. I'd love for you to share a story or two and just kind of help these these parents navigate that emotional part because I feel like. Yes. If you could get a handle on that, all the practical stuff would be a little bit easier. Mm-hmm. Sure. So um, when Chanel was in sixth grade uh, in elementary school, I'm sure all moms can relate to this. You have the, your sixth grade camp. And so they go, and they're all so excited. They all are waiting for the sixth grade camp. And Chanel always, for every field trip, for anything, she always had to have an aide with her. She always had an aide because of her seizures, because she had a very severe seizure disorder, um, which could, could ca- have caused death. Now it's under control today, but back then it was very severe. And so she always had her aide. And, and also it, was just, it wasn't just for her seizures, it was to help her with everything, with her education, with, with, with basically most everything. So. Um, She went to uh, uh, her teacher. We had an IEP meeting because we were were talking about how we were going to set this up so Chanel could go to camp because I didn't even want her to go to camp because I'm like saying, no way, she's not going to camp. And her teacher, which was a really sweet lady, and she had my my other two children as well, um, and she adored Chanel. And she was what, because sometimes, you know, you don't have a good relationship with your teacher or it's more challenging than others. So this year I had a really good relationship with this teacher and I really trusted her. And she said, Valerie, just let Chanel go to camp. She's going to be fine. I promise I'm going to take care of her. I'm going to watch her like a hawk. It's going to be fine. Really, it's going to be fine. And, and um, so I said, okay, okay. So, so we had a big IEP meeting. I had the nurse there. We wrote a specific uh, medical action plan I mean and I I went through and and it was so specific I it was like a three-hour IEP with everybody imaginable there so I did my homework I made sure everything was in place on paper and everybody knew they were supposed to connect with the camp um, uh, director and immediately talk to the medic and the medic was supposed to have her information and know who Chanel was and have her medicine and everything was supposed to be taken taken you know care of and so they get there on the bus. So literally three hours after they arrive, I get a call saying Chanel had a seizure and she's in the medic office three hours after they arrived. So what, by, the t- we, um, by the time we got up there and, we, and, and the, all the information came out later, what happened was they got there they were all excited. They went and they found their rooms. They kind of unpacked a little bit. And then uh, they said, let's go out for a little hike. So Chanel and the, all the kids are out for a little hike. And of course they number off. Her teacher did not go with her. The teacher was off doing whatever she was doing. And two of the camp little assistants, you know, who are just young girls that volunteer, mm-hmm. took Chanel out on a hike. 
and they were just walking wherever they were hiking around the area. Chanel had a seizure out in the middle of the forest, fell down on the ground, seizing on the ground, and all the little kids kept walking, and Chanel was left out in the forest on the ground. And when they got back to camp, they counted off, and Chanel's number wasn't there. That's Chanel's number. Where's Chanel? Then they went out and found her laying on the ground, having seizures, because when her seizures start, they don't stop. They, they're ta called tonic-clonic seizures, which why is why they're life-threatening. And then they brought her back in, and they gave her meds. Thank God it did stop, because many times we, we would have to call 911. They'd have to come, and they'd have to inject her with a certain medicine that stops the seizure. Um, th thank God it, it stopped without having to call 911, because she would have been seizing for, I don't know, a half hour or however long it took to get her in there. Um, and, cause, and I never got these specifics either because I asked and they could never tell me the time limit, how long it took and all these, you know, specific questions. They never could answer me. And, um, so we went up there and picked her up and got her. And, uh, so that's what happened. I was very upset with the teacher, you know, needless to say. And she was, she was so upset as well. And, but she, you know, she, she didn't, she didn't keep her promise. She didn't keep her eye on Chanel every second. And I even, and I asked the medic when he called me on the phone, do you have, um, did you call 911? Do you have Chanel's medical action plan? No. Do you know my daughter Chanel Abrahamian? Have you been briefed on her? No. So they didn't have the medical action plan. She, he didn't even know her name. He was not prepared. They didn't do any of the things they promised me they were going to do. So that's, that was a huge, disappointment to me. I felt extremely betrayed and, um, and infuriated and enraged that my daughter's life was put in danger because, I mean, I did everything I could do as a parent and as an advocate to protect my child, and they were completely negligent in every step of that plan. Yeah. So that, that, that's one of the, one of the stories. <laughs> I remember, I remember hearing you tell that for the first time and thinking, uh, people might not have lived through that if it happened to my kid. Oh my goodness. So, so how do, how do parents kind of like, what are your suggestions for them being able to move through the emotional part of this journey? Because, you know, they spend, I imagine you spend the majority of your time tasking right like in the practicality of every day interacting with them getting them to appointments and therapy sessions and like all these things that they need to have when do you find time to take care of yourself and handle all the crap that is likely coming up during this process mm -hmm. so that's been always a challenge for me and to balance um, my job and my advocacy with taking care of myself because I tend to become an, a workaholic and then I don't take care of myself and then I get burnt out and then I have pain in my body and, and it's not good and then I have to slow down and then I have to take care of myself and then I feel good again. I start going to yoga and I start eating really super good again. I do all the things I know I'm supposed to do. Then I go into workaholic mode again. So it's like this bouncing back and forth and to find that balance is so difficult. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm much closer, of course, but I still am not there. It's still really hard because, you know, when parents call me and, you know, cry and tell me their story about their child, how am I supposed to say, oh, no, I'm sorry, I can't take your case. You know, I mean, because my I've been there and and I just know this is you know, one of my purposes on this earth is, is to do this. And so it's so difficult to be able to balance it all. And, um, but um, uh, for, for parents, you know, what I found was one of my lessons too, is that um, I find that a lot of parents kind of have the attitude like, well, my child has a disability, so you know, it's okay that they're over here in this class over here and they don't get to do certain things or they don't get, you know, they're kind of like a second class citizen and the parents kind of believe that. 
in mm-hmm. their minds that they, their child, it's okay if they don't get everything or get to do everything or have the same things. Or, and I was like, no, no, your child is special. Your child is, 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 has so many gifts and talents. They just haven't woken up to that yet of the big picture of their child. So that is one of the big lessons along the journey too. And I think that's connected to um, how we feel about ourselves. It's because if we don't have a really good self-esteem, belief in ourselves, or, feel, or we feel less than, then of course, when we have a child that's different, we're going to feel the same thing about them. So, and I had that same lesson growing up and because that goes back to my um, story of my Christianity of believing that, oh, well, I'm never good enough. You know, I, I, I always have to be striving, striving, striving to be good enough. And then it carries over into that as well. Mm-hmm. So, and that's, that's, I think, one of the lessons that they're here to teach us is that, you know, how valuable we are, are, all are, and that our gifts, our talents, our, what our purpose here, you know, uh, in this life, um, that's what they're here to teach us. And that's what Chanel, one of the gifts that she's given me and has taught me. Mm-hmm. And, um, and has just, uh, another good example is that um, I used to work myself to death and because I, because I couldn't say no, even to the parents that didn't have the finances to pay me, I would still take their case because I would feel, well, a good spiritual person would do this, you know, would, would, would do it anyway. It's not about money. It's about helping the kids. So then I would get all that mixed up too. And then, and then I'm in burnout mode because I'm not only working too much, but I'm I'm working for people that aren't even paying me for my time. So that was a huge lesson for me too, to come to where not only was I, you know, stopped that, but, um, but I would came to the place where now my fees are at the top of my industry as an advocate, because I know the value of my services and, and my expertise that I offer and that I'm serving the children with. And um, that was a big lesson too. A big 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 lesson yeah it's it's the easiest thing to do when you know that you have something really really powerful and valuable to you know because I mean if we could we'd just give it all away right like I would I would help people with their stories and write books all day if I could because I freaking love it I know and, you know it's yeah. also my love for it doesn't pay my electricity bill so that I can use uh-huh. my computer and <laughs> I mean, and so like in the, in the perspective, you know, it's great for messengers to hear, but also like you said, for parents, because if you're not taking care of yourself, then there's only so far that you can take care of your own children, right? Because at some point you're burning out at some point you're losing your temper because you haven't eaten all day or you haven't hydrated or you haven't moved your body yeah. or you haven't, you know, called a friend to be like, do you know what happened when I sent my kid to camp? Like, yeah. you know, process all of that emotion. Like it piles up oh. and, um, God, I didn't even have, I didn't even have the stresses with my kid. And yet all of my own story and pain that had been built up over all of those years, you know, all it took was taking him past nap time to a store yeah, and having him ask for something I couldn't afford Mm -hmm. exhaustion and shame. And I turned into a monster Uh like, yep. So it's not just, it's not to take care of you. It's to take care of you, to take care, to keep doing what you're here to do, to do the thing that you want to do, which is take care of your kid. Like exactly. take care of yourself so you can take care of your kid. I love that that's such a um, important cornerstone of your book because you do, you, you share so much about the, the spiritual and emotional journey that was going on behind the scenes of all of the stuff that was going on with Chanel and losing your other daughter. Like, you know, and we got to remember that we're human and that we have emotions and we have a body that yeah. needs our attention. So. Absolutely. I love yeah. that. So, I mean, you'll get, you, that's how people get really sick and get diseases and stuff, you know? Right. 
So I know. never mind relationships. I mean, what are the statistics for relationships of marriages that where they have special needs children? Oh yeah, eighty five percent end up in divorce. Eighty five percent. Yeah, that's another huge component. It's Div- for your marriage. Yeah, it's like because your kids need you to keep it together (laughs) and have some sort of structure and solidarity in their lives. Yeah. I, very important work you're up to. So what would you say are like the practices that really keep you mindful and in your, you know, grounded in your work, but also like in your humanity. So you're taking care of yourself. What are some of those things? Mm -hmm. For me, um, because I've always been, so connected to God and such a spiritual, <coughs> excuse me, a spiritual seeker is um, my yoga practice is so important to me now. And um, just my meditating and going to lots of fun things like um, yoga um, conferences and, and um, um, the fun events and, and just being around those, those people um, uh, uh, really helps me to remain balanced and feeling good. And I read a lot. I'm always reading many, many, all different. I love all the different spiritual um, teachers. So I read all the time. And um, um, I'm always in some kind of a spiritual program. I'm always doing some kind of a program. Right now I'm doing Mastering Alchemy, who Jim Self is the um, heads up that, and it's amazing. And there's always, there's just so much out there. So for me, it's my spirituality that balances me and how I take care of myself. And I also love to paint. So I do that when I can, because painting is a huge outlet for me. And it just like takes me out of everything, <laughs> just like meditation does. And it's like, I'm not here anymore. I'm just painting. <laughs> so it feels really good. <laughs> yeah. so that and um and just then yeah being with my kids and um like right now my granddaughter's here for the summer and that's really fun and you know doing doing fun things instead of working 60 hour work weeks (laughs) yeah yeah Yeah. how about that there's an idea i know (laughs) so what are your final tips for um you know well obviously we have aspiring messengers who probably have stories similar to yours and also, you know, like as far as having this story, this journey that they want to take to the world and yet, you know, they feel confused or stuck and they're not sure if it's valuable enough. And also the parents, like what are some of your best tips and offerings for them to encourage them to keep going and not give up? Mm -hmm. So I would just say that I just would go back to, I, I just truly believe that our kids are a catalyst for our spiritual awakening and to teach us to know ourselves and the value of ourselves. Mm-hmm. And that that's their, their, that's, they're the teachers and that's what they're teaching us. And that, you know, it's not a tragedy, but it, it, is, it can really be a blessing. And that that paradigm shift in thinking it will just open everything up. But as long as they stay in that victim, why me? This is a tragedy. It's so sad. Because in the beginning, it is. And you have to go through those grief stages. And I talk about that in my book too. Going through the grief stages, that's an absolute necessity. But then getting to the acceptance and that it's just once you can catch that paradigm shift in thinking of, wow, this is amazing. You know, instead of, I don't want to be in that club, the mother club of having a special needs child. Yuck. No, thanks. You know, which is what most people's first reaction is that, Oh my gosh, this is so, you know, I mean, and that doesn't happen. I can say, you know, it's not going to happen for a while. Then you'll look back in retrospect and then all of a sudden you'll realize I I'm okay. Now I, I feel that way, you know, and it is a journey to get there. But really, just to know that's a possibility, that's the light at the end of the tunnel, instead of sitting in that sorrow and grief for too long, you know, because we get stuck there. That's when par- marriages break up and the, the suffering happens mm-hmm. and it can be extended for longer than it needs to be. So yeah. that would be my, my real message 
that just the the value of these kids and um, that because almost everybody has a child now on the spectrum or you know ADHD is just like a commonality now with mm -hmm. almost uh, the other neurological disorders you know um, OCD and all, all the other things um, but autism is I mean, almost every buddy either has a child or, or is very close like it's a niece or a nephew or a best friend or someone in their circle they have an autistic child and so it's it's very it is out there it's here and there's a reason for it to be here if we can look at the positive the big picture reason it can be so such a huge and powerful message for us all in our in our world today personally and globally yeah Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And, and then for the messengers who are like, because not only I think it's important for the, for the people listening to know that, like you said, your work is very overwhelming for nine or 10 months a year. It's like morning to night, morning to night, morning to night. Right. And I remember getting the emails like, um, wait till summer, you know, yeah. and it's like, okay, I'm gonna get it. So like, what were some of your the ways that you kind of moved yourself through the hard parts of working on the book schedule. Yeah. I mean, writing about a child's death cannot be anywhere close to easy. Yeah. I mean, what were some of the things that helped you navigate that? So when I really got in the flow, that flow that you hit, you know, it, I just got, that I don't know. It was like a God thing. I was like in this space and, uh, or on the, you know, this level of energy um, that I got, we used to get up at 4.30 in the morning, many, many days. And I would just, and I would write in the middle of the night or like super early, like four, like early. I would just wake up and I'd go downstairs and I'd get on my computer and I'd start, and I'd start writing. And that's when I got my best work done was mm -hmm. during those times because nobody was up. And then, and it, it wasn't even, a lot of it was during the year when I had my insane schedule. I did a lot in the summer. We, we got a lot accomplished, but I still was working that whole year when I finally got in that flow. But I, but it, like I said, I think it's, it was the timing. Mm -hmm. And it's like, now it is, now it's happening and it's going to happen. And it's going to get done. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's yeah. and it just kind of all went into place and I had the energy and the, the motivation and I, and, and God just gave me everything I needed to do it. And I did it. Mm -hmm. that, yeah. that happened for me. Yeah. And I think for you too, it was a structure. I remember so many conversations that we had about like, this is so complex. Like this is so rich. What can be, what needs to be woven through, which is why I feel like you created a masterpiece because it has so many different layers. It's not just, you know, practical. What do you do when you have a child who needs this type of support? But it's also like, how do you take care? How do you go through the grieving process? What does that look like? I mean, you short, you shared really personal stories and it was like, as soon as you saw like, Oh, these are all the elements that need to be in each chapter. It was like, I watched it all fall into place, but it's so hard because yeah. sometimes if you're missing one of those, it's like your, your soul, your unconscious is like, Nope, you don't have it yet. Don't do it. <laughs> yeah. You're missing that's, and that's what it was because I, I was so, I had all this inside me that I wanted to share and I had, I was so confused with how, how do I organize it? How, what, how do I do it? And there's so many different like components to it. We talked about that mm -hmm. all through the book and like there was so many different levels mm -hmm. and, um, it, it, but we did it and I could have never done it without you. So it's, you were um, such a huge, that, you're the reason why, I mean, I, I couldn't have done it. Yeah. yeah. I, it was, it was my honor to work on that book and, um, and everyone who is, who has a special needs child or knows a parent of one needs to grab this book because 
it is something that is not just practical, but it will help them to feel not alone because it seems yeah. like that's the thing that I hear the most often oh is like parents feel like they're so alone and that nobody understands their frustration and their pain and their sadness. And it's like, no, everyone does. And y'all need to start talking to each other. <laughs> yeah. They're all going through the same thing. Sharing your stories. Yeah. I know. And that to, for the other messengers, I have a good tip that I just remembered. So I was so shocked that, um, cause after I wrote the book, of course you think that all of your family, everyone you know in your whole life is going to be so excited as you and sit down and read that book, you know, <laughs> right? Well, I kept asking, I kept waiting for like my, I mean, this is like, like my close family, my family to say, to, to, to talk, say, I read your book. It's amazing. <clears throat> no. I, it's like silence. It's like, and then I started realizing they're not reading it or they didn't read it. Or even if they said they read it, they probably didn't really read it because I wasn't getting feedback or even any comments. Mm -hmm. So then, I, then, then the light bulb went off and I went, they're not going to read it because again, but then the, for the, my peeps, you know, in, in my community that with special needs kids, there was the feedback coming mm -hmm. of, yeah, I cried through the whole book. Yeah. Oh my God. And tell me how it affected their lives. And that was where, cause that's the audience, you know, yeah. that's where it's going to be meaningful. But so don't expect to get support or encouragement or even interest from those that might be the very closest to you because it doesn't, it's not their thing. Yeah. It's so, I, I'm so glad you brought that up because mm -hmm. I love how you talked about it, a post journey. Like, I mean, for me, I kind of told, told a few people in my world, you probably don't want to read my book. I actually <laughs> recommend that you don't because I'm good now, but it might be hard for you to see where I was. Um, and, and it wasn't for them. It wasn't going to help them necessarily, but uh -huh. But I find I, I had a few people like helping me through the process of writing it. And it was funny because I would ship my chapters, you know, write a chapter a day and ship it and I get feedback and, um, and I got feedback and all the moms were like, Oh my God, this is amazing. Yeah. And there's one particular person who, whose advice I have taken to the T and gotten amazing results in my entire like business and life, like just this amazing person, but she wasn't a mom. And I shipped her the, the content and she was like, yeah, I don't, I'm not. And so it was like my own moment of when you're asking for feedback, make sure that you're asking for feedback from the people who care about your message and who can relate to it. Yes, she cared yeah. about my message. She was my biggest advocate for getting the book done, but yeah. she didn't have the understanding of what it's like to be a mom and struggle yeah. and, you know, yeah. have all of your crap come up when yeah. you're looking at this precious little child. Like she had no idea. Right. So. Yes. Just know your people, know your people, choose them wisely so yes. that no one accidentally takes your confidence and joy in the process down with their yeah. feedback. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, that, it's just so true. So true. And, and that even goes into the whole work uh, area and that, because a lot of, it's the same thing. It's like, they're not really interested. A lot of them don't even understand what is it that I do. Right. You know, and it's just like, okay. Okay. All right, I'm just going to go help these people who know exactly what I do and need it. Yeah. <laughs> I would come home and play with you guys. Yeah. Oh my God, it took me so long to figure that out. So long. Yeah. <sighs> well, okay, I warned you. Because you hear that from a lot of people. Yeah. Like the yeah. Does the same thing. Yeah. Well, I warned you this would happen, that we'd like get talking and then like a full hour and oh, yeah. disappear. Yeah. So um, we, we have to stop. But... Yeah. Before we go, I would love to ask you my rapid fire questions that I ask all my messengers because, you know, I love to hear about new messengers and books that I haven't heard about and I okay. think it's important. So what was the uh, first book or message that changed your life? That was so hard. <laughs> I was thinking about that because I don't think there was a, like a first because for me, I think it was probably 
when I was um, kind of opening up my box of spirituality, and then I started going to yoga. So I'm thinking spiritually, it was most likely um, um, Paramahamsa Nithyananda, um, the guru that um, I went to India for. Mm. So, and he wrote many, 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 many books. And I've read some of them, but I could never read all because there's like, he's written like 200 books or something. <laughs> but I've read a lot of them and he's amazing. Um, and in terms of my business, um, it was, you know, the legal stuff. So, I mean, I, I follow Pete Wright and he has a newsletter called Wright's Law. That is amazing. I always recommend it to all of my um, advocates and parents and because it's, it's awesome. And he has books and I read all of his books. So that would be in terms of uh, my business book. And what's your favorite book ever and why? Oh my goodness. I have so many favorite books. Um, well, I would say right now that what's really super relevant, which, what, uh, but it also goes along with the um, program I'm taking by Jim Self. And he wrote a book called, What Do You Mean the Third Dimension is Going Away? And it's really good. So, and it's been out for a while. So, but it's super good. And it has to do with the Mastering Alchemy program that he, he does. Love it. And who's your favorite messenger and why? So I have to say it was my yoga teacher, Lisa Gomez because she was the one that when I started out my whole journey of opening up the box and, um, and she opened up all the doors for me to be who I am today with spiritually. Yes. She's yes. a powerful messenger in the yoga room. Let me tell you, like, yes. I can't find anyone like her. I always tell people she ruined me because it's like your life on the mat right now. That imbalance, let's talk about that. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, and she's just doing it, teaching the class. Right. It's, yeah, I know. It's unreal. I just, I love her so much. Love her. <laughs> oh my God. Thank you so much for being here. I want to make sure that um, this audience can connect with you after this, after they watch this. So what's the best way for them to connect with your website or... So uh, my website is advocatesforangels.com. And um, the best way to connect with me, though, is by email. And my email is uh, V-A-S-P-E-D at sbcglobal.net. And I'm sure you'll have that probably. Yeah, we're gonna right, Amanda? And link it all up on the page. Have a link to your amazing book. It was her daughter graduating with honors. Yeah, that's Chanel graduating with her honors diploma. <laughs> Love it. Well, thank you so much. And thank you to our listeners for joining us. As always, I'd love to hear any sort of feedback on what you're taking away from the interview today. And, um, and I want to thank our, our sponsor, sitechisel.com, because they're amazing. And they offer a 10% discount uh, to my listeners for anyone who uses the code MINDFUL10. And um, that's it for today. Thanks, Valerie. Thank you, Amanda.